some to expanding audiences for unfamiliar work, Lessons from Ballet Austin. This webinar is going to feature the resources and learning from Ballet Austin, which is funded through the Wallace Foundation. And my name is Amy Fitterer, the Executive Director of Dance USA. Our speakers today are Cookie Ruiz and Michelle Martin of Ballet Austin. Cookie is the Executive Director. For more than 30 years, she has been working in the areas of strategic planning, organizational development, and nonprofit fundraising management. Since 2002, Cookie has held the professional designation of Certified Fundraising Executive by the Association of Fundraising Professionals. Cookie currently serves on the board of Dance USA, and she's actually one of our former board chairs. She is also on the board of the Performing Arts Alliance, Vice President of the Board of Directors for Texans for the Arts, the Board of Directors for the Mayor's Better Austin Foundation, the Board of Directors for Housing Works Austin, and she's a member of the Austin Area Research Organization. Cookie is also a fellow of the National Arts Strategies International Chief Executive Program. In 1996, Cookie joined the staff of Ballet Austin as a development director, then became general manager in 1997 and executive director in 1999. Accompanying Cookie is Michelle Martin, Associate Artistic Director of Ballet Austin. Michelle began her tenure with Ballet Austin in 1991 as a dancer with the company, and in 1992 she was appointed Ballet Mistress and Curriculum Director of the Academy. <clears throat> Just a few years later, in 1999, she founded Ballet Austin II, which is Ballet Austin's apprentice program, providing professional development for the 10-member second company. Martin serves on the Texas Commission for the Arts Advisory Panel and uh, also the, has re been a recipient of the Austin Under 40 Award for her contributions in the areas of art and entertainment. Martin was appointed the Associate Artistic Director of Ballet Austin in 2000. So welcome. I'm thrilled to have these two highly experienced leaders of Ballet Austin presenting their learning today. Thanks so much, Amy. Um, we wanted to uh, begin today to uh, uh, start by having you take a look at the Wallace Foundation mission because we feel like that's a very important part of this initiative. Um, and then for us specifically, the Wallace challenge that's been placed before us is, uh, is one that asks us and requires much more than churn in terms of our audience. Uh, it requires us to be focused on strategic growth and that we would be building through the retention of our existing audience uh, while employing strategies that are sustainable beyond the project and beyond the presence of the funding. Um, and so uh, partnering that growth with retention piece is, is certainly part of the charge. Additionally, you can see that we've been asked to avoid mission creep that often happens uh, when pursuing funding and to develop a strategic question that is relevant to the field and in the case of uh, the Wallace Foundation, um, their, their research extends to 25 funded organizations across the various disciplines. So we thought we'd give you a little bit about Valley Austin's approach, focusing on, first on our team. Um, our project fo is focused on uh, less familiar work or unfamiliar work, and so in that it's uh, focused on the art itself, we knew that we would um, want both our uh, executive administration staff as well as our artistic staff. So I'm very happy to be joined with Michelle as, as co-lead to the project. Um, in terms of our, our, the other members of our team, Julie Leugden um, at Valley Austin effectively represents two departments. Um, the audience engagement sales and services might be the equivalent to a marketing department and a sales department. So uh, she and her team members there. Um, community education, based on Brown, and then um, our development uh, team is led by Christy Cuellar Law, also a certified fundraising executive in charge of our relationship building philanthropically. So those are the folks leading our team. Um, our original question in the RFP, we asked ourselves um, these words, and as we think about this idea of changing community, 
Um, I would want you to know that Austin is now the 11th largest city by population in the United States. We've always considered ourselves a sleepy little town, but we're finding ourselves with a, a, real, a real struggle of a growing um, metropolis in, in, some, in some regards. We are a majority-minority um, city. We have about 150 people a day moving here. Um, and so with, this, with all of this growth in this changing community, we're also thinking about the fact that our core mission – here at Valley Austin, goal one, priority one of our strategic plan has to do with the creation of new contemporary work. We've also quite recently, uh, through a, fin a philanthropic gift, um, received an, a restricted gift to endow now and in perpetuity contemporary new work. So this original, this original question for us um, really speaks to our core mission. In terms of the quantitative goal uh, we're trying to achieve, um, looking at the less familiar work and its sales patterns, we wanted to start uh, quite incrementally and grow by about 10% and then moving towards that 50% by the completion of the third learning cycle. The second statement relates to time. Um, an earlier research that we did in about 2002 indicated that over a period of about three to five years, single ticket buyers or um, packaged buyers would begin to elect less familiar work. And so our question is, could we reduce that time? Could we move along that continuum more quickly? So um, let's talk a little bit about the continuum. When we created this during our RFP process, we actually started by putting it, um, we teasingly call it our big bang board. So we had a great big whiteboard, we still have a great big whiteboard, and we, we began to draw off um, and think about our work. And we wanted to create a graphic that would serve as a tool helping us map the audience member's relationship to the work. So we took our, all of our rep, or the repertoire, we um, disaggregated it, and we re-aggregated it into these five buckets. And this is actually the second go-round. Uh, the first go-round was much more definition of style. So the far left would be classical, and then maybe neoclassical in number two, and then maybe three might be uh, contemporary ballet, et cetera. So it's more of a description of, of styles and movement. And then ultimately, we settled on this, uh, this collection, and I'm going to move from this, um, this version to the version we use today. Um, and it was within about a month, I think, that we realized that, that the five buckets, that it just wasn't quite right. And there was a day in staring at that same whiteboard um, that almost like just a couple of pieces moving inside of a kaleidoscope, and they shift ever so slightly, and now the picture is quite different. All of a sudden, there was a symmetry. If you removed the third bucket, there became a symmetry to this idea of um, being able to, to re-aggregate the work around those works that were reliant on a narrative on the left-hand side, and then the works on the right-hand side having the absence of the narrative. So if you go to what we refer to now as Cat 1, Category 1, um, that would be those folks responding to or choosing um, highly narrative work but very familiar, Swan Lake, Romeo, Juliet, Cinderella, and Peter Pan. Peter Pan, in many cases, is very contemporary work but is very familiar. And it were things like Peter Pan that allowed us to know it was less about the movement quality or the style and more about the relationship the audience member had to the work. And then in the case of the second work, the examples that we list, um, Stephen Mills is as a choreographer and our, and our artistic director is an exceptional storyteller as well as a, a, a exceptional choreographer. Um, and there are a number of works that, for which we are very well known here and some of those have had quite a, a, a long life in terms of being licensed and toured. And so these would be things where you might know that there's a narrative, but it will not be as familiar as the narratives in the first column. It may be that you don't know the narrative at all, like the Holocaust and Humanity Project, which is a human rights work, is led by, metaphorically by a narrative, but it's not a narrative that you know before you arrive, for instance, but some narrative there. As we move to Category 3, um, Cat 3, as we refer to it, there will, these are non-narrative works, but there might be some element or there will be some element of familiarity there. It might be a choreographer's name that you know, in the case of Twyla Tharp or Balanchine. It might be that uh, we're, a, we're a city that truly loves um, music. 
So it might very well be something in the area of I know the composer. And then in the fourth category, we this is, there's probably nothing there that's familiar to me. And so as we move to trying to move uh, the, the growing the audience, as well as moving the audience, but growing the audience for categories three and four, um, these were these were the kinds of works we would be talking about as we continue today. So in terms of round one, what happens next um, is that it was really time for us to think about research. Uh, Wallace made this pretty effortless in that they gave us an opportunity to, to select on our own who might lead us through this process, and we went um, into an RFP process that was national and ended up selecting Slover Lynette to do both a qualitative and, a qu and quantitative research. The qualitative took place in the summer and the fall of um, 2015, and basically that process was a, was a focus group work that happened. Um, it basically informed the language and the content that became the quantitative research tool that went into the field in the fall. And so I want to just quickly give you a bit of a top line of some of the things that we learned from that process. And um, beginning with this presence of an uncertainty gap. In the beginning, we believe that we would be, we had written so many words up on our board, and, and we often would write the word curiosity and circle it. And we thought that we would be trying to make our audience more curious. Well, it, come to find out, that's a rather hardwired um, experience, being curious, something like being born an extrovert or an introvert. Um, so ultimately, when Slover Lynette um, sort of uncovered the presence of this uncertainty gap, we we palpably feel its presence. Um, it, it best explains the fact that people will almost run up against the edge of a canyon, and then the question is, how wide is that canyon? Is it just something they can leap across with a little bit more information, or is it actually the size of the Grand Canyon? But we know that that presence is there, and it's been a really important tool. A blinding flash of the obvious it says no audience is homogeneous. I think we all probably intellectually know that. But my experience in the field and, and spending a lot of years in this field and working in a cross-disciplinary way, we do have a tendency often to treat our audience as one thing. Um, and so the fact that a, a, um, a segmentation study kind of came out of this work and we, we, it allowed us to think about different personalities and different types. But it really, we do a lot of um, MBTI work here, Myers-Briggs um, work here. So it um, just allowed us to think about how adaptive we are as a team to our different personalities and thinking, uh, of course, that, that same thing exists uh, within our audience. Um, we were also extremely delighted to find that about 68% of our audience is rather open. Now, they're not purchasing the less familiar work, but when, when pulled on this question at, at depth, um, they, they, um, they presented themselves as open, giving us quite an opportunity. The next slide, I think, is an interesting one for us in that if you will look to the column of uh, percentages on the far left, these are the general preferences of our audience uh, next column is sort of our ability of, as Bally Austin to deliver to those preferences, and then the far right column being where we are to the good or, or perhaps in deficit. So from this, we've grabbed the social experience and the emotionally stirring, so the emotional experience as places where we had a deficit and had work to do in closing that gap. Um, and so that allowed us to think about as we began to build what we refer to as the familiarity framework, Michelle will go into more detail of what that framework looks like today, but it is a term that we use to refer to the collection of audience engagement activities used as sales strategies to create new to file purchases, but also to be used to reactivate those subsequent sales, that retention piece of it, that activity that happens post sale. So creating this two-by-two two logic model to allow us to think about, are we doing enough things in the pre-sale to connect with someone that wants to connect with us strictly socially? And are we giving enough information or providing enough or making the right connections for that emotional intellectual connection? And then on the post-sale, what happens? And realizing that our post-sale, what happens after the sale, the moment of the sale, is actually all the strategy for the reactivation. So that's how we use this particular two-by-two. Additionally, in our uh, research, 
we've been very interested in some of the wonderful studies that have come out of the field of music nationally. And we thought, let's talk a little bit about dance and see what we have in our audience in, in terms of personal participation in dance. And I think Slover Lynette was stunned by this result, as we were as well, with nearly 60% of our audience taking um, dance as a child. You can see nearly 50% in music. The 34% of our audience taking dance today was really stunning for us. We have a very large training facility for adults here at Bally Austin with about 12,000 adult students. So, you know, the, the question for us is they may very well be taking dance with us, and we should have been or need to be as aware of that as possible. And then finally, we also have for 60 years run a, a, the Valley Austin Academy. So 35% of our audience members, their child is taking dance today. We did not ask specifically ballet, but they're involved in dance. Um, and then finally, on the post-performance surveys, um, just the mention here is that it had been a long time since we had routinely conducted post-performance surveys. Um, while it requires this as part of their, um, their our obligation, and so um, we, are, we are enjoying that process of getting that feedback. So less about this particular slide and more about the presence of those surveys. Which leads us to data mining. And so and I will say that uh, – This is Michelle Martin. <laughs> that that uh, it, it, all of the research that we had the opportunity to do, the qualitative and the quantitative and then the post-performance surveys, all of that seemed like such an amazing – gift and there was so much possibility within that and then on top of that we had the opportunity to do some data mining and I will say personally that I had um, little understanding of what could actually be wrung out from from looking at uh, purchase patterns and ticket sales data um, I felt like what could we possibly learn in addition to what we'd already gotten but what I what we quickly realized was that while the qual and the quant um, and the post-performance surveys showed us what people think they do or what they report that they do, but the data mining actually shows you what did they really do. What things, even though they, they said they might be open to certain productions, what did they really buy? And so the first round of data mining that we did really looked at audiences for a four-year period prior to our implementation of any of our engagement work coming out of, of, our, of our research. Um, so it was a really, it was almost like a benchmarking snapshot, which was very, very interesting. Um, some of the big things that we took away, many of the um, groups in our Wallace cohort are actually doing work that's based around um, age, particularly millennials, and uh, engaging those audiences. We found that our audience is actually quite young, 70% are younger than 51 years old, which was, even though that's not the focus of our project, was very interesting for us to kind of uh, just reaffirm that. Um, one of the other key things that we found, uh, as we were looking, we had originally envisioned that over this possibly three to five year period of moving from narrative work along the familiarity continuum towards non-narrative work, we had envisioned that people would be stopping in each of those little categories and that it would be very kind of linear and organized. And the, the data mining really showed us that it was not. People would could come in in a non-narrative to see a non-narrative production and then actually migrate back up uh, up the, the continuum towards something that was narrative. Um, sometimes they would come in for something that was highly narrative and then the next thing they purchased would completely bypass and go to something that we would have considered to be quite um, a big leap for them. So that was very interesting for us to kind of get a sense that it wasn't going to be as, as simple as we thought. Um, probably our one of our biggest takeaways had to do with the um, the significance of the Nutcracker audience. And for you know ballet companies, the Nutcracker is such a huge um, part of sustaining the, the organizational, sustaining our organization in terms of the revenue that, br that it brings in and this once a year effort. Um, and I think traditionally the conversations that we have had and I, I know that I've had with other colleagues is that the Nutcracker audience is an anomaly audience. It's comprised of people who view this one time a year experience with dance as 
uh, as more related to the Nutcracker as a holiday celebration, but they were people who were unlikely to be interested in any of the other work that we had, that we offered during the rest of the season. But you can see if you look at this graphic, the red the red circle indicates that nearly 25% of first-time Nutcracker buyers actually come back. This particular graphic in, illustrates over the next four years actually come back to see something else. And while many of them come back to see the Nutcracker, you can see that there is some movement into other categories, including category three and four, the non-narrative works, which are the smaller bubbles. It may seem small, but when you think about how large the Nutcracker audience is, even 5% of those returning into a non-narrative audience in, you know, is realized in a quite a large bump in ticket sales. And this was, again, related to, this was data that had come in before we actually started doing our concentrated engagement with this audience. And so this was actually without trying. We were generating people to come back. So from all of this data, we began to develop what we call our familiarity framework. So along with our original hypothesis, along with the familiarity continuum, which was the range of our repertoire, we, our goal was to test whether we could have a group of engagement activities that could layer over top of the, the continuum, and we would call that the familiarity framework. And this would be the activities that we that we decided and, and designed for, based on our research who would, that would help us move people along the continuum. One of the things Cookie talked about, the uncertainty gap, that we recognized there was an uncertainty gap, and that, that is a little bit different than, the, than familiarity. We had originally thought that all of this was based on familiarity. Familiarity is, is somewhat, in our idea, more related to to education and information, whereas uncertainty is a personal feeling. It's a personal level of confidence that you will get something from that work and that you belong in that audience. And so as we started to think about how we were going to design these programs, we were taking in all the information from the research, but then also looking at it through that filter of not just trying to educate, but also helping people feel confidence and certainty. Um, some of the works that end, some of the programs that ended up on this framework are things we've been doing for a while, and some were very new. Um, we definitely know that probably the majority of organizations represented in this webinar uh, this morning are organizations that are already doing engagement activities, as were we. But we, it allowed us a different way to focus and to be intentional about the way we deliver this this material. One of the new things that we piloted, thinking about the emotional, intellectual connection that we wanted to make with our potential audience members, was a strategy for single ticket sales. Um, it was a, uh, a live streamed rehearsal with Stephen Mills working with the dancers and then some moderation going on, a narration or moderation going on in the background. It was uh, somewhat of a replacement for an in-studio moderated rehearsal that had had generated some interest but was not necessarily a vehicle for single ticket sales. Our thought was if we did, went digitally with this, we would be able to give more people access. We would allow them flexibility to tune in or to grab it on demand. We also launched what we call the Letomania, which is basically an interactive discovery lounge, which is set up in the theater and is available for patrons to visit prior to the performance at inter and, or at intermission. Some of the things, and, and this is basically a series of stations that, that are, give uh, patrons an opportunity to go a little bit deeper into, some, uh, into the production that they're about to see, as well as some of the more evergreen information about dance and dancers. Um, so you can see here we incorporated some of our dancers, our often our ballet Austin two dancers, if they're not performing, will be part of that and we'll be able to walk the audience through that. We had some interactive digital components. We had, as Cookie says, our interactive analog components where people are writing on sticky notes. We started to try to cultivate that idea about emotional and intellectual, so asking people what did this production make you think about and what does this production make you feel. Um, we, you can see it, we start to gather quite a bit of volume, and one of the things, like most uh, urbanly-based uh, 
for, uh, theaters, there can be a lot of congestion uh, getting to and from the theater. And there's often uh, also uh, problems with access and egress from the parking garage. And so we really made a concerted effort to encourage our audience to arrive early, up to an hour early. So we created a wait. And then we filled it by giving them, really guiding them towards some of these activities, including Belletomania. There was also some really um, interesting opportunities for intergenerational kinds of um, intergenerational kinds of uh, activities, where you can see children and their parents and grandparents getting involved. To the social end. We um, were responding to, as Cookie pointed out, that big red negative 30% number on that on the slide that indicated that people wanted a social experience but didn't necessarily feel they would find that with us. So we just became much more explicit and intentional about our social endeavors. And so for Hamlet, we piloted the Ballet Bash, which was basically uh, retrofitting the terrace in front of the theater and turning it into a tented lounge with a dance floor, a DJ. People could come prior to the performance at intermission for a little bit, linger after the show, get a drink, and uh, sit and talk or and socialize with the people that they had come with. Uh, we also launched a new video strategy. Um, and so we talked about the data mining indicating that there was much to be mined from the Nutcracker audience. And so traditionally, when we have the Nutcracker audience with us, we would show them a video about the next full narrative production that they could see, which was generally a production that we would perform in May, so five months later. For this Nutcracker in uh, 2015, we ended up showing them a video with Stephen talking about Director's Choice, which was our our February production, which was a mixed rep. And the we just did it uh, and just put it out there to see what would happen, and we actually saw ticket sales. There were people who came to Director's Choice who specifically stated in their post-performance survey that it was the video that they'd seen at Nutcracker that triggered them to make a purchase and, and take a chance on Director's Choice. And then there were a couple of other sort of legacy programs that we've been doing for a while, a Footlights pre-curtain speech and encore post-performance speech, our question and answer with the artists that we retained. Uh, the post-performance surveys actually allowed us to, to uh, confirm that the audience found value in these because they do take staff time, and so it was helpful for us to have that kind of confirmed. So um, I want to share a few of the round one takeaways, and, and we are – um, as we exist today, we are now only one-third of the way through. So this was sort of that mid uh, between year one and year two. The question that we continue to ask even today, but we began to ask at that time, is ultimately are we, um, are we interpreting the data correctly? And we have now so much great research and information. There was a sense, and we kind of hoped, that you get the answers at the back of the book and you do the research and there it is. But there is still very much this need uh, to make sure that we are <clears throat> checking ourselves on the application of the research and thinking a lot about that 68% of that audience that's open. Are we doing as much as possible to unlock their potential? Um, our digital strategy, as Michelle mentioned, is really working, um, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But we're beginning to see evidence of its effectiveness and um, in trackable sales. Uh, it's one thing that we learned that is was uh, a bit surprising, but but a truth, and that is that young does not equal open um, because there's a lot of thought that a very young audience is going to, by their very nature, be one that's, that's very, very open to become more curious or to be more curious or to uh, like the less familiar, and that actually the research shows quite the opposite. Um, fourth, we remain committed to getting the framework right, making sure through the post-performance surveys we know that our audience members are beginning to engage with the elements of the framework, but are we actually growing the audience? Um, and that for us is that important part of that challenge from Wallace is it's not about churning the audience, it's actually about growing the audience. Um, and then there are, we are learning from our audiences that there are elements that, of the framework that narrow the uncertainty gap and then others that trigger sales. But that narrowing piece is one that is very interesting to us because it's more of a deepening activity. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, and then last but not least is thinking more deeply about this 
the difference between this social and this emotional intellectual connection and experience is making sure we're designing experiences that fit those needs. So in round two, the start of this season, we went into, um, we have this wonderful opportunity to um, go back into a time of research. Um, but we started with our key strategic questions. And as you see them, they're, they're very well related. They're very um, a, a connected to the very first question that we asked. Um, but I think in this, in this, the second question now is we're beginning to use the second question. The first, talking about those engagement activities in the framework, working on our target audience of our existing audience to return to these less familiar works. But in question two, can we cheat time? In a, in a city that's changing as rapidly as ours, will, will we have three to five years? And can we figure out a way to get them back sooner, um, which is a really important to us. I mentioned an opportunity to go into a second round of qualitative research, and we this time chose Phoenix for that um, for that opportunity. And um, in terms of the, the the focus group process, um, Phoenix did a, a really wonderful job of getting us to look at some interesting groups of people. Um, and this particular round of research, looking at their different purchasing patterns, including one Nutcracker only group among them. Um, again, in the past, we would have left Nutcracker out completely and said, those folks only come one time a year. But this time, we realized we had an opportunity there. The technique that they used involved an art project uh, where the folks that were coming actually brought something with them, which is quite interesting. And the re results of these observations um, led us to make some immediate changes. And um, so we want to share a little bit of that with you just to give you an idea of how quickly we moved um, with that information. Um, as Michelle mentioned earlier, uh, we were working with a production company on a, with a multi-camera live stream in-studio rehearsal. Um, it was, we were getting really good at it. Um, each time we did it, it got better and better, and I think we developed some really strong skills that may very well fit into another environment. But ultimately, uh, Michelle mentioned, this was a single ticket strategy. This was go online and have this opportunity that was real time and then sell tickets. And that it, it not only um, did not have the intended results in terms of the ticket sales, when these videos were shown to our focus group members, there was quite a strong visceral reaction that was negative to this experience. And what the aha, a second sort of blinding flash of the obvious for us that came out of this experience was, a category, what we would say, a cat three or four audience member would have fully engaged in this idea of the, re the, the process behind the work. But that category one and two buyer is the one that we're trying to, to involve in migration. And ultimately, they, that was not what they wanted. It's hard to say that, that they weren't ready. And it's not really about readiness. It wasn't their choice. It wasn't what they wanted. Um, and so ultimately, their preference, they wanted to know why, why are they in those sorts of clothes? Uh, why are they not in their costumes? Where is this? Um, and, you know, et cetera. So there was no real understanding for um, the rehearse rehearsal environment, and which was fascinating to us. So we were inadvertently um, widening this gap uh, that we were trying to close. A couple of other findings that came out of the focus group, they wanted to know exactly what it looked like. Do not show us behind the scenes. We want to see... We want to see the, the full production. We want to see the finished production. So show us what it will look like. The other thing is they wanted us to be their partner in getting other people to come. Uh, could we send them really short uh, videos and really interesting visuals that they could forward along and get people to come and, and be involved with them? We learned that titles matter and that sometimes the titles themselves, through that process, we might be unintentionally expanding the gap because it might be that title, there might be something in that title in a perfect world that might signal that, that one area of familiarity that was missing. And then finally, um, with those attending Balladomania and a whole group had, um, a whole group of our respondents had gone through Balladomania, their thought was, once you have us there and we're enjoying ourselves, don't just focus on the ballet we're about to see or the work we're about to see. Tell us what's coming up and help us get interested in that. So that was a really good takeaway for us. Um, the realization around the uncertainty gap I referenced um, a moment ago, and that was the point of we realize now 
that there is not just a closing to the uncertainty gap. If it is of a size where we can figure out that, you know, that right trigger, then we can close that gap. But in some cases, that gap is um, wide enough that we actually really need to spend some time in deepening activities to begin to, uh, to close the gap rather than, um, than, or I should say, to narrow the gap rather than actually leaping over. So it makes us think um, a little differently about that, the size of the uncertainty gap and the, and the need that we have through the familiarity, um, the framework of making sure that there are enough different types of offerings that each individual can self-curate their personal bridge across that gap. Um, and that leads us to the second round is data mining. And the second round of data mining basically added in data from the 15-16 season. So starting to see some potential results from the work that we've been doing uh, with the familiarity framework during the 15-16 season. Um, and it basically reinforced what we had already learned the, because there was not that much new information. But the one thing that, that was clear was that though the migration patterns were very similar, that there was the, there was an increase of a migration to the familiarity, the CAT4 ballets, the ones on the very far right of the continuum, from first-time buyers of all other categories. So there was more migration into that, that far right, the least familiar types of stances. Um, and then that Nutcracker just really reinforced that Nutcracker continues to generate the most returning buyers of any other uh, ballet. So from there, we went back to the familiarity framework with all of this new information. And there were two areas, as Cookie said, we made the, the Belladomania more about uh, uh, splitting time between what are you seeing right now and what can you potentially see for the rest of the season. So we did make it a little bit more future focused. And then there were two other things that we really dug into. Our digital strategy, we had already started to see some success, but we wanted to to, to mine as much as we could out of that. One of the things when we talked about um, the difference between um, being familiar with something which has more of an educational feel to it and being certain that you might belong in the audience and how that connects to the idea of an emotional connection. We went back and as we approached our videos, we, we worked to change the tone to make them more evocative um, less like a sales pitch, less like an educational lecture, and more um, more conversational, where they were revealing the emotional possibilities and how it might feel to be in that audience. We also really tapped our artists. We recognized as we were doing the qualitative research that our dancers are very, very recognized and well respected in the community, and that people felt uh, comfortable hearing from them and they appreciated that. We also, through the dancers, were able to, as two dancers would talk about sharing a similar role in a production, they would each talk about how they might, there was different meaning for them, which started to build this idea of, for, the, for our patrons, about constructed meaning and how it's, it's perfectly appropriate that two different people would be taking something different away from the same dance so that people may be less uh, tied to having a very concrete and specific narrative. Um, and then you can see as we, as we just scroll through some of these that we worked to give very stunning kind of warm emotional images and we also started to use subtitles, captions, so that people who were seeing these in at the theater or in our lobby would be able to uh, really understand, have some dialogue to go with what it was that they were seeing. Um, and then the other piece that was something very new for us that we started, that we prototyped this fall with the second round of the of the of uh, our grant, and that was something we called the Artistic Advocate Program. And the goal of the, one of the things that came out of the qualitative was that when people would talk about um, what actually triggered, so perhaps the uncertainty gap had been narrowed sufficiently, but what actually triggered them to buy a ticket or to go and sit in an, a new, a different audience, an audience for non-narrative work, often it was something that was not Ballet Austin that pushed them over the edge. Often it was a peer, it was a friend who said, I would, I would really recommend that you don't miss this or I have a ticket, I want you to come and experience this with me. And so we started to think about what was the potential of peer promotion as a method of growing our target audience. And so we launched this idea of the Artistic Advocate Program. 
And we did something that was it was very new, at least for, for me, was we started, rather than designing the program and presenting it, we gathered in a couple of stakeholders and had them co-create and design the program with us. And we decided to start first with our board. So we talked to, we gathered four, four board members who became very instrumental in helping us design what this program would be as we went to build the prototype. And as part of that conversation, the prototype uh, so much of what the prototype was came from the input of these board members. Um, one of the things that you'll see here is the sort of layering, and, and the idea originally was to have an artistic advocate go directly into the community and start to recruit uh, potential patrons from there. And, and through our conversations, we landed on this idea of the artistic advocates who would be very close to Ballet Austin, very close to our work and very protective of our brand, which became, which we realized was extremely important. Um, and people who had already made, sort of migrated themselves, came in seeing narrative work and had migrated to non-narrative work, so knew what that felt like. Then those people would then tap people in their own network who we called community connectors. These were people who had some uh, relationship with Ballet Austin and had very large social networks and who so the artistic advocates will would be seasonal and then the community connectors would be tapped on a production by production basis based upon their own personal taste and then it's these connectors who would then access their social network to sell tickets um, as part of that we also worked to provide the advocates with a toolbox of resources. So basically things from our familiarity framework that could be replicated digitally. Um, and this came from one of the things that we learned that was actually became the more substantial goal for this first round was we started to watch as one, the, one of the advocates who took on the took the lead role in creating this private Ballet Austin Insider's Facebook page and Instagram page, um, she started to, to, the things that she picked from all of the collaterals, the, di the digital resources we had, the images that we had, we sort of gave her access to everything. And then she started to sort of to curate basically what we kind of recognized was she was curating a bridge across this uncertainty gap for her peers. And then, and so that was ended up being for for this first phase one of the prototype, the, the more um, the, the the richer experience for us in terms of just watching this pro this process. Um, and we also worked a little bit on um, after the the community connectors had brought their patrons in as we piloted this for Magic Flute. We also discussed the what would what was the how are we going to retain people? What was the retention strategy? Because it was not about just having people come in for one show. It had to be they had to want to come back, and how are we going to make them feel like they really belonged in our audience in general? And so we, as a test, we did a post-performance, very informal gathering that was in the green room backstage, and it was just the artistic advocates and the connectors and their patrons. There was no staff and there were no artists there. And it turned out to be this little jewel. It was amazing. The feedback from the artistic advocates and from their connectors was so unexpected. They found that this held such value to them, and they and everyone commented that this seemed to be the key of getting people to talk to one another, to feel that they had they were now part of this little social community that had, as one of the advocates said, just the right amount of exclusive because it was backstage and it was an intimate group. And so that is definitely something as we build out this prototype to launch it for the season next year, that's definitely something we're going to be spending a lot of time on. So that brings us to round three, which will start on August 1st of this coming year. Um, we enter that period uh, with many, many questions. As I mentioned a little earlier, we're one-third of the way through the six-year cycle, two years uh, with funding and two years beyond that. And the focus is really at this point forward on sustainability. We know that the question that we're asking is not unique. In fact, it wouldn't be very useful if it were unique. We feel like many people uh, working throughout the, the arts and not just dance by any means are thinking about these issues around uh, the freedom of the, of the voices of our artists 
to speak to us and making sure that we build wonderful audiences uh, to engage with that. I also know that many people are doing um, a lot of, of these same sorts of strategies. For us right now, it's about identifying the most effective, lowest cost elements of the framework. Um, and through their efficacy, knowing that these are the things that we will be doing and we'll cease to do the things that we were doing that were nice to do, but not necessarily uh, um, achieving their goals. Uh, we're developing an evaluation tool that we hope will help reduce some of the subjectivity around these decisions. And then, of course, you can imagine with, with um, looking at sustainability staffing becomes such a really important part of the implementation and what is, uh, what is possible there. In closing, um, just a couple more slides, and that is that um, there, you cannot go through something like this without having these wonderful indirect impacts throughout the entire business. We're thinking a lot more, um, and there are, there's a lot more depth to data analysis and being metrics driven as a company. We are using the informal focus group process in two other parts of our business right now, and it's pretty amazing. We're thinking a lot about prototyping, and prototyping is something that we use a lot through, the, through our Wallace project, but prototyping in other types of our business, using some of our own resources to, to take a little risk, but to keep it um, very much within this framework of identifying and evaluating and observing and then deciding what we, what we would confirm and what we would release. And then, and then at the end, thinking deeply about observation and trying to force ourselves to uh, step away from assuming or, or sort of working from gut instinct. Um, so if you, this is the, uh, this is, these are uh, an images from the Wallace Foundation's uh, website. Um, the the WNET um, from New York, the PBS affiliate, was responsible for Valley Austin Stories, Wallace Foundation. Um, commission them to do some work of a collaborative team, and I'm probably not uh, acknowledging all the artists involved in that process, um, but they came and spent some time with us, and so there's about 11 minutes to give you um, even more information if you are interested in following along with us. This will give you an idea of where we've been. And then finally, we wanted to provide resources that will um, give you more information. Some of the videos that we've shown, you would actually be able to click in and go and see them, so we wanted to offer these to you. Um, as a tool uh, for you today. Great. Thank you so much, Cookie, and thank you, Michelle. I know you had a lot of content. You guys have been doing so much work, uh, learning so much, and thank you for sharing it with us. For those of you who joined during the webinar, uh, just as a reminder that Ballet Austin is one of 25 arts organizations funded by the Wallace Foundation to explore practices and building audiences for sustainability. And Dance USA is a national communications partner for the Wallace Foundation on this program, along with our other national arts service organizations. So we are helping to disseminate and share this information. The list that you just saw of resources will be sent out to all participants uh, in this webinar following our webinar today. And we do encourage you to watch the video that uh, Cookie briefly showed you a snapshot of and read the article. There's great information in both of those uh, resources there on their learning to date. Uh, now I'm going to move into just working through some of the questions in the few minutes that we have left. Uh, so uh, this question for Cookie and Michelle, the first one that came in, what kind of content do you include in your artistic advocate toolkit? Uh, this artist writes or administrator writes that they do something similar, but they don't always have success with others using it. Uh, we pretty much give them access to to anything that they see on our on our website. Certainly, in terms of like the images, uh, any of the videos. The other thing that we also one thing I didn't mention is they also can have we give them quite a bit of access into the studio, which is a scary thing. Like as a person who sits at the front of the room in the studio, I, I was it was scary for me to offer that up, but. Because I'm the one that kind of interacts with them, we can arrange things so that it, it, it's not disruptive. And then it, it just allows them to, to kind of soak in, in the art a little bit, um, particularly when we're thinking about doing something that's new, that we can't show a production video of. Uh, and then there's a lot of what comes from that also is the dialogue that is created on the Facebook page um, around 
around the, the images and the art that's posted. We, one of the things that also happened was that very quickly she, Renee started to ask for 30-second videos, and she would take what we had and she would say, can you make a video that's from 35 seconds to, to you know, a minute five, and so that I can share that. And, you know, once you have those markers, and it's, it's not a, too difficult of a thing to do, and it, and it was worthwhile for us to try and, and do that. Great, thank you. Um, another question, there's two questions related to the videos that you used. Um, one is, how did you serve the video to the past Nutcracker buyers? And a second similar question is, are you playing the video in the theater before the Nutcracker performance? So um, right before our, the show begins, or each performance begins, and the house goes to dark, um, we, there are trailer videos that are shown then. And so in, uh, we have found that it is, is a very effective way. You have a captive audience. We are not a company that does a curtain talk. So in lieu of someone coming out on stage, that's probably the same amount of time we use uh, with, this, with the videos. That for us with something as large, and we talk about a nutcracker audience, but for another company, it might be whatever you do at the holidays or it might be the signature work that is, that is the work when you do it, everyone comes. Um, but we know that when we have that large audience, uh, we are very we, we very effectively use that audience to um, to market. Um, Michelle mentioned that in the past we would have done a bit of a, a an Amazon approach. You know, come back next May when we'll be doing a full length classic. And so we were um, also able to know that there was nothing else in the field at that time. And so as we began to see the sales come in, we were able to to know that that was what had actually moved uh, moved the needle a bit. Great. So I'm going to do two more questions that have come in, and then we'll have to wrap up. Um, the next question was, why build a tent for the Hamlet social engagement versus using the lobby space? And I think they might have meant the Ballet Redux, but uh, Bell Redux. Why well, use a tent? It, no, I think it might have been that we showed the Ballet Bash. Um, and they, one of the interesting – it's a good question – um, but one of the most interesting things that happened in the value engineering portion when you build a performing arts center during a down economy is that all of the outdoor space was supposed to have been the lobby. So the lobbies are actually quite small um, and do, do not allow ourselves. We don't have those big sweeping uh, lobbies in our performing arts center, and that terrace is one of the joys of coming to that facility is it's the best view of Austin is from that terrace, and people just migrate in, in that area. So basically, in an area where people were already gathering, we created an opportunity, um, and it was beautiful to come out during the intermission and seeing people during the intermission of the dance production watching people dancing. And so um, it was it was really quite um, a beautiful thing to see. It's also quite expensive, and so um, I think that that is being able to do that every time. Ultimately, we found another way to bring that social component at a different price point into the building. So actually a very, a very good question. My last question that I'll share today is, you mentioned the Advocate Connector post-show had no staff or artists. Can you elaborate on why no staff or artists was an important element? Well, one of the things that we heard at the learning community, once a, twice a year, Wallace, the Wallace Foundation gathers all of the grantees at, together, and we do uh, – we have the opportunity to share some of our learning. We have an opportunity to do some um, professional development. And, and one of the things that, as we heard other people talk about their kinds of ambassador advocate programs, uh, one group mentioned that they had, had tried this um, and, and that they, had, they did not include artists and that it, uh, it seemed to create an environment where people felt more less intimidated to share. And we do still offer the opportunity for people that want to hear from the artists, they can go into the post-performance Q&A. It's just offering options for people that really just want to talk among themselves without feeling like they're doing, you know, making a misstatement. And in our first round of research where we got to, we had the opportunity to hear from people that were primarily Category 4 buyers. We knew that there was an interest that they had in talking to one another, but they didn't go to Encore. They didn't want to come have someone tell them about the work. They wanted to go somewhere and talk to one another. So we also, I think, when we heard the, 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 the suggestion that uh, Michelle just shared with you, it, it linked back to some earlier research findings of ours 
And, you know, we all desperately wanted to be in that room. We would have loved to have been a fly on the wall, but we knew when they, we knew when we got the feedback that we'd done the right thing, that they wanted that opportunity without any of us to just, to respond to the art itself, which is rather, you know, really rather a beautiful thing. That's great. Well, thank you so much. Uh, it's been absolutely wonderful to hear from Cookie Ruiz and Michelle Martin of Ballet Austin about their learning today in the Wallace Foundation program, Building Audiences for Sustainability. Um, and Dan at Dance USA here, we're very happy we've been able to help share this information with a nice group of you. Again, we will be sh sending out all of the resources. Uh, following today's webinar to all of you, including the article that's been written about the Ballet Austin Learning, the brief 11-minute video on the Ballet Austin Learning, as well as some other uh, very helpful information on the uh, Wallace Initiative. So thank you again for joining, and I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thank you all.